Well, Tristan, I, I have to ask, first and foremost, how excited were you uh, about CeCe making good on his, his word and, and coming to see you make your first playoff start? So I actually didn't even know he was there the whole time I was pitching, at least. Uh, it might have been good for me. I'd have been a little nervous. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was it was nice to, to have him come out and support and just know he was there in the building, especially, like, when I got off the mound and just know that I went out there and kind of did my thing. Yeah, See, no, it was, I definitely – I had to show up. You know what I mean? I, I knew once he was pitching game two, I looked at the schedule. Uh, I, I called the commissioner. I was like, we got to be in Cleveland. But game two, so, uh, <laughs> you know, I hitched a ride and was able to watch him go out and do his thing. It's, it was great to be just in that atmosphere. Like, for me, to going back to Cleveland, you know, as a, you know, former player there and to see the fans and, and downtown and how excited they were and to see him go out and pitch well was amazing because I hadn't seen that stadium full like that in a long time. And and uh, it, it was a great atmosphere again. I, see, you watching Tristan this year, what has stood out to you and, and how did you guys connect? I think just for me, what stood out the biggest is just watching him being able to stay even keel. It's just, you know, he don't get too high, too low. It's just kind of staying in the same spot. You don't know if he's up by 10 runs or if they're down by 10 runs. It's, it's com I'm coming right after you. I'm going to fill up the strike zone and, and you know, try to get after you. So that's the, that's the thing that I've seen him or, or just any starter. You know, when you see them get to that to that level where they're just attacking, nothing else matters, don't matter the count, don't matter the score, I'm coming after you and throwing your, my best stuff and I'm just going to execute all game. Um, I feel like he got to that point really, you know, really early in the season and just kind of rode it out, to be honest. Tristan, you, you go out in your first playoff start and you totally dominate. I mean, how did you keep emotions in check? How did you, you know allow yourself to just cruise the way that you did in such a big spot? Uh, I think a lot of it was trying to remind myself that as much as I could, it was the same game. Uh, and I think one, I think uh, a majority of that was like being able to throw game two and kind of watch game one and see how interactive the fans were and kind of just almost get accustomed to the, the environment a little bit, allowed me to kind of go out there and almost kind of be myself a little bit more and not get caught up in the outside noise or, or focus on anything besides going out there and trying to do my job. Now, when you are, uh, you, you're looking at the series against the Yankees and you're slated for game three and it's going to be back home. Is there any part of you that's happy to not be pitching at Yankee stadium, but be on your home mound instead? Uh, I mean, I think I'm, I'm happy that I'm going to get to throw in front of the home crowd again. Uh, yeah. But I, I don't think I'm shying away from the New York competition at all. Uh, I definitely think the fans are going to be super engaged, and I'm excited to see what the crowd's going to look like tonight and just feel the energy at Yankee Stadium, and hopefully the boys will get going. Yeah. See, you want to give Tristan a preview of what it might be like pitching as an opponent on a Yankee Stadium playoff mound? Oh, no, it's going to be – you know what? I've, I've actually never pitched here as, as an no, opponent. No, you were in Cleveland. Yeah, was, that's yeah. right. So I, w that's I don't know right. what it's like to pitch. Uh, <laughs> but I do know what it's like to pitch in Cleveland during the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> on both sides of that. But, uh, yeah. no, I mean, I think, you know, having a chance to go back home and pitch at home in, in that atmosphere – um, the first game, you know, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Like you said, having that chance to, 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 to see it all, go through the intros and all of that stuff, um, you think that helped you, right, going out in game two? Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I think being able to, like, almost watch Bieber go out there and dominate and pitch his game that he's been doing all year and being like, well, I mean, I can try, I can just try and follow up with that and just do what I've been doing all season. And I think I went out there and tried to, tried to keep it as even keel as possible. But anytime I got to two strikes, I'd hear the crowd and I'd, I'd get like super amped up and it was just like in those situations, I, I tried to take, take my swings and, and try and like punch guys out. But I think outside of that, it was more just trying to find my rhythm. How, how about the Cleveland organization, Tristan, you mentioned Bieber, you know, it, the long line of outstanding arms, you know, dating back to when C was there, but it's continued with a fury since then over the you know recent history, you being one of these pitchers, what is it about the organization and the organizational development that you guys have seemingly, you know, endless supplies of outstanding starting pitchers? Uh, I think it's a culture. I think it's a, I think if I had to sum it up in one word, it's a culture. I think like when I get drafted and I don't necessarily know what takes back from Cleveland because I'm fresh out of high school, I'm literally just entering a new professional organization, but I can look to the top and look at guys like Corey Kluber 
uh, Trevor Bauer at the time, who's pitching really well, Mike Clevenger. I see guys that I can go, all right, these guys are up there and they're at the top of their sport. You have a Cy Young winner, multiple Cy Young winners. You have guys that are out there winning games back to back to back and they're going about their business a certain way. It kind of just when you talk to the pitching coaches, uh, when you talk to them about being like, okay, so you've, you've worked with Corey, you've worked with him, you work with him, like what makes him successful? Uh, and a lot of it is literally just them talking about how they go about their business in between their starts so that when they actually do have time to go out there and pitch, like they're, they're out there just having fun and doing their job. They're not necessarily worried about what happened two days ago or what their mechanics are looking like or what's going on behind them. It's more about them just going out there and putting their best foot forward. You know what's crazy just, about yeah, no, I was gonna say, I, no, I was gonna say I think it's just a culture and I think it's just kind of it's repetitive. I learned it. I think the guys behind me learned it and it's gonna keep going. Yeah, and it's just, you know, that that the organization, they do a good job of maturing guys. Like he said, you know, understanding what you need to do in between starts. Like getting drafted and getting into the minor leagues, we all know that we have talent. I think the 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 Cleveland organization organization does a great job of making you let, letting you understand what's going to separate you from the group. You know what I'm saying? Whether that's mentally, physically, whatever you need to do, they figure it out and, and help you mature in a way that it, it helps you out on the field. But off the field is where you grow the most. You know what I'm saying? And the first thing I, I heard from Tony Amato, who is the, the equipment manager, who is somebody that I love and trust in that organization. First thing he told me about Tristan McKenzie, he's like, you're going to love him. And I knew he wasn't talking about on the field. And that's something that, you know, that organization, you know, they do a great job of just, you know, drafting and, and, and putting the right humans in their organization that just happen to be good baseball players. You know what I mean? So they're all receptive to the, to the knowledge and everything that everybody has in the organization. And it makes it easy to develop guys when you're drafting the right people. Mm -hmm. Something you could feel in the minor leagues as well, Tristan. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think like, I have lasting friendships with guys that I got drafted with guys that got drafted after me, guys that got drafted before me, just based on who they were as people, how we interacted off the field, how we got along. And I think on top of that, I think it allows me when I play with guys like Bieber or Savali or police in the past, or I'm friends with Will Benson since he's got drafted. Like, I think these are lasting friendships. Like I'm, I'm on a team with guys that I'm personally friends with. I, I want to hang out with them outside of the field. And I think that just adds to our, our camaraderie on the field and just how we play for, play for each other. Now, Tristan, you <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but if you did not get drafted and, and go to Cleveland, you were going to actually go study to become a doctor. Is that right? That's correct. Is that something that you still want to pursue someday? And you're not going to need to, but is it something that you have any <laughs> interest in in the aftermath of, of your baseball career? Uh, I mean, I've, I've honestly put a lot of thought into it. I don't necessarily know if I'll want to be a doctor. I think that's a lot of school in terms of just post baseball and my age and a lot of stuff. But uh, I think it's definitely something that I'm still interested in. I think it's something that almost drives me today. Like when I talk to my training staff in terms of how my body feels, I think I look at it from almost a different perspective. Where did that come from? Uh, I think is, I, I think I, my, both my parents are in the medical field and I was almost always surrounded by it and I took a liking to it, but I think I, I always like try to give back and I love helping people. And from a young age, I wanted to, to be a surgeon because I thought the best way I could give back was by, by trying to save people's lives or by helping them that way. Hmm. That's pretty really cool. cool. Really yeah. cool. Really cool. I know it's like, I'm glad we're getting to see you in the major leagues now, but I also would have been fascinated to see you dominating at Vanderbilt while also, you know, going to become a, a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. That'd be a pretty cool story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, it really would. It really would. Tristan, how about, um, you know, for you, I know I've read a lot about the way you, you give back and, and, uh, specifically, I know, uh, I believe there was a 13 year old gunshot victim who you spent a lot of time with this past year. Um, and just like follow up visits and, and a lot of your community work in Cleveland reminded me of my podcast co hosts and, and the work that, that he constantly does not only in Cleveland, but you know, here in, in New York and, and, uh, everywhere that he's been back in the Bay as well. You know, what, what kind of is your focus as you go in and you try and give back your time like that, or even in this specific case with the, the teenager who, who you've spent time with, what kind of is your focus as you're, you know, as you're giving back your time and, and you're, you're using some of your resources to help these people? So I participate in a mentorship program called True to You. Uh, and I think what I mainly try to impart through that mentorship program 
is as much as I'm a major league baseball player and to a degree, I'm a celebrity or a high profile person in Cleveland. Uh, I came from somewhere just like they come from somewhere. Uh, I'm a regular person, just like they're a regular person. And I try to impart that to as many of the kids that I mentor, as many of the kids that I talk to at my camps uh, that I can, just because I believe that I'm no different from any one of them. Uh, I could have very well been in another way of life. I could have been a doctor. I could have been a lawyer. I could have been anything else. But I think baseball is just kind of how it ended up for me. And I think just trying to impart to, to a lot of those young kids that there's a lot of decisions that are going to be made in your future and you never necessarily know what's going to happen, but you shouldn't look at something as unreachable because it may not necessarily be for you right this second. And I try and impart that to kids as much as I can. And see, Tristan is mature as hell at 25 years old, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's what I was saying about that organization. You know what I mean? Um, having a chance to, you know, be in that organization, be around these, these, these young players. This is who they, this is who they are, you know? And, and I think, you know, you know how, how Tristan said, you know, be, being able to, to show up in communities and, you know, show kids that, you know, and, and for me, I think it's, it's, it's important for kids to know that and understand that we come from the same type of communities and the same neighborhoods that you come from. Like, they see us sitting on TV or sitting somewhere and they think it's unattainable. And, you know, for me, it changed my life when Dave Stewart walked into my, my Boys and Girls Club. I say that once a week on this podcast. So for me to, to walk into a, bo a Boys and Girls Club in the Bronx or in Cleveland or in, or in California, and if it changes one kid's life, it was all worth it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, makes, it, it makes giving back, you know, a, a, a obligation for me because I know how much it changed my life. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow up with that. I think, like, C says it, like, if I go and I change one kid's life, uh, or, and I think for me, it's just like, I don't know, for me, it may be a little thing, but to the kid, it could mean the world. And that's really all that, that matters to me. If I go when I run a camp and a kid comes back with a baseball that I sign and three weeks from now, he doesn't remember it, but he remembers getting the baseball and just the elation and joy he felt like that's all that means to, to me in the end of the day. Like, I just want the kids to be happy and I want them to enjoy like my presence and just being in certain situations. Tristan, you were born in Brooklyn, right? And then how, what, where did you live growing up? Where was your geographical route before playing high school in Florida? So, I mean, I, I, we moved down to Florida when I was about five. Okay. So I mean, I'm a Florida boy, but I have, I got Brooklyn roots. I got New York roots. I got a ton of family up here. Uh, we lived up here for a little bit. My family, uh, this, this is where my parents met. Uh, so a little bit of both. So, so, so you got you... Brooklyn roots for sure. Then like you got New York roots. <laughs> yeah. I, my, I got, I got lots of family up here. So are they are they all uh, at Yankee Stadium for games one and two? No, no, no. I don't. I don't need any Yankees fans beating up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, I already told one of my friends who's from Cleveland, uh, who's going to one of the games with me. Hey, I, I'm not going to be around you if you're wearing any Cleveland stuff. I don't want to catch any <laughs> shrapnel. No, no any problems. Is it, is it yeah. that bad? Is it bad like that? Ruko or no? I don't. I mean, I wouldn't know. We wouldn't know. You it, know what I'm no, saying? no, I know. It it depends, man. They, I it depends. It depends where you are, who you're around. You know what I mean? Like every once in a while, I so will then, say, yeah, it's bad. Then it can so be then. bad. It can be bad. It can be bad. Yeah, it can be bad. You didn't want to so, shit on your own fan base, but yeah, well, so it's bad. Because the worst I've ever experienced was Philadelphia. Philadelphia in the 09 World Series. Oh my gosh. The I'll stuff I witnessed, I was like, this is crazy. Like I I literally I was wearing a Yankees hoodie or something like that. I took my uh, my friend had like brought a jacket that he wasn't wearing. I was like, I'm putting this right over, man. I'm not gonna catch him. <laughs> I'm not like I, I'm I, I, I'm not I'm not gonna be taking any more of this, man. It's uh, uh I'm sure your outfielders will have plenty to say about it, Tristan. I'm gonna oh don't worry, I'm gonna be trying to talk to Miles after every half inning. Here are those things <laughs> I gotta say to <laughs> It'll be entertaining. We've had Mookie Mookie's told us some funny stories where he is thoroughly entertained. Uh, out there in the outfield. He yes. has been during a uh, Yankees Red Sox in the past before he went to the Dodgers. Tristan, how about your curveball, man? C and I love getting into some of the, you know, X's and O's of baseball, especially when we talk to other pitchers, your curveball's filthy this year. You know, your, your major league rank, your curve was first in opponent average. It was fourth in opponent slugging. It was first in K percentage, third in whiff percentage. How did you learn your curve? Uh, it's the same curve I've been throwing 
since I was probably like nine. I changed my grip like a little bit, but I literally just like moved up on the ball. Uh, it's the curve my dad taught me, and it's I I don't even I don't know 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 how to explain it. It's kind of like second nature. <laughs> why is it so nasty, man? Uh, honestly, I think a majority of why my curve works well is because of my fastball. I think my fastball is not necessarily overpowering. It's not 95 to 100 all the time. But I think even my 90-91s or my 93-95s, like, they get on guys. And when I throw the curveball off of it, it's kind of hard for them to lay off of it. I was about to say, he throws the curveball off of his heater. You know what I mean? So it looks exactly like the, the heater until it's not. So it's, the, it's exactly the same. The same arm motion. It's the same. It's the same whip. Everything he uses is the same until... It looks for a hitter. It looks the same until it's not until it's break, until it's falling off the table. So mm. I think this the deception of it looking exactly the same. You know what I'm saying? So it's the tunneling of of you know him actually getting into the same spot every time with the fastball, and he throws the curveball off of the heater. And I and I will say I've been like my dad taught me to throw fastballs up in the zone at like nine or ten because I wasn't actually throwing breaking balls, so I was using fastball changeup super early on and just trying to like move my heater around and then use my off speed off of that. And I think once I got to a certain point where I saw how well the tumbling worked, especially when I threw the heaters up in the zone that they didn't necessarily want to swing at, but they had to respect the heaters up of the zone because I would throw the curveballs for strikes and then vice versa. When the curveballs are down, they kind of have to respect the heater at the bottom of the zone as well. So it just kind of played up. And then I think as my development is kind of incurred as well as me getting to the major league level and talking to some guys and kind of brushing up with some guys, I think it's just gotten more refined. Tristan, I love that your dad taught you that heater all the way back then, and now you're using it in the big leagues. Like, what when you're you get done with your playoff start? Who who's the the first person you want to talk to? Who is it? Someone in your family? Is it is it a friend? Like, who who are you like just anxious to have a conversation with as soon as the game's over and you pitch like that in your playoff debut? Uh, my dad, my dad's usually my first call. And if, if it's not him, it's my brother. Uh, those right. are the two guys that have been with me the whole time. And I always, I always get a nice text from my mom. Cause she knows how to, she knows how my emotions work after games. So she's, she's usually the one that I actually talk to. Sometimes my dad, <laughs> my dad doesn't get it and I'll have a bad game and he'll be like, so what do you got on the game? And I don't want to talk about the game at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny how that works, right? Like it's fun. I have this tradition with my mom before I do any broadcast, um, play by play where she always texts me look great. Sound great. As soon as like the first thing she hears or whatever. And it's like, I, since I, my, since I started, I did my first NBA game when I was 23 years old since then, like every single game. And it's just like, gets me in my right frame of mind. You know, my, and it's funny. my dad, my dad texts me before every game. He gives me a game plan in terms of like establish your heater, get in the zone early, use your off speed off of it. And I read it before every game. I text him back before every game. So he's usually the guy that I call after the game, just to, like, oh, like, what did you think on this? What did you think on that? And I think outside of myself, he's my biggest critic. So it's always good for me to bounce ideas off of him and just try and because I think he has he has the most experience with me in terms of like how my mind works, especially when I'm out there competing. So I'm able to like talk truthfully to him and get like true information back out of him. So I love it. That's awesome to have that. You know what I mean? Where you can have that and, and just be to speak to yourself and then get that real feedback back. That's awesome. That's so cool. I love that. So what's dad got on how to pitch Aaron judge? Uh, he's probably going to say, get ahead of him uh, <laughs> and, ex and expand the zone from there. <laughs> I think anytime you're behind that guy, you're in trouble. Absolutely. What, what, what about Tristan? What does it do to have a guy like judge batting leadoff for an opposing pitcher? I think, I think it'll, it, I think you just have to be ready from, from the get go. I think with this whole lineup, it's, it's, something to say that, that you have to be ready from the start. But when they got judge leading off, it's more like they're not giving you a break or even any time to kind of warm up or, or ease into the game. Like you got to be locked in from, from the very first pitch. Hmm. When you, um, when you're coming up and you're developing as a baseball player, what were your visions that you had for your baseball career? What did, what did you think you could achieve and how is what you're experiencing now different or matching that? I wouldn't say I'd set any like long-term goals for my career. It was more, I think going through the minors, a lot of it is like, where am I now? And, and where am I trying to get to? And it's, I think it's a big leaks for a lot of guys. Uh, and I think once I got here, it was more just like, I think I proved myself in the minors and I tried to dominate guys in the minors. And once you get to the bigs, there's like this, this 
big mental adjustment that a lot of guys face. And I think I had to face it as well. And I think over the past three years now, two and a half, three years, I've just gotten more into a, a mind state that I belong. I can go out there and compete. And it's more, not, not only am I trying to do it from pitch one to pitch a hundred and whatever it is, or do it for my outings. I'm trying to do it from the beginning of spring training until, from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, my whole off season, my, my spring training, all of it. I think it's more of just a developmental curve and just trying to get to a point where I get to a certain mind state that I'm able to go out there and compete. I know you're a big video game guy. Is it mixed into your game day rituals or superstitions? Depends on how I'm feeling. Uh, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of nights, like the day before I pitch, I try to get like, I'll grind ranked is what the kids call it. <laughs> I'll, like, I'll grind ranked, but like, I'll get into like super competitive uh, ranked apex games, or I'll just try and play the game and get to like, I think video games is one of the only things that I get physically like amped about outside of baseball, everything else. I'm like pretty mellow, low key and video games get me to like that same, like adrenaline rush. And I love playing it competitively to like almost get myself in the same mindset. That's it. That's, that's so cool. It's so <laughs> funny. I I know I'm now like one of the old dudes seed. One of the old hear, dudes. You're old yeah. as fuck, guys. What are you talking well, about? Well, well, because, <laughs> because when I hear grind ranked, I have no, no idea what Tristan's See, talking that's about. Why prefaced, no that's idea. why I prefaced it and said the kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very nicely done. I knew All what right. that meant. I knew what that yeah, meant. You I got a 12 year old. Yeah, up there grinding right now. He's fucking. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> Tristan, when you take the mound, game three, do you, are you, how do you think, how, how, how do you think you're going to feel? Will you be nervous, excited, adrenaline pumping? What, what do you expect the feeling to be like when you take the mound in game three? You know, I, I definitely think I'll be anxious and excited to pitch and all of that. I think it'll all depend on the game. So I think we'll see what, what happens here tonight and we'll see what happens on Thursday and kind of moving forward, trying to trying to get to a place where I'm not thinking about anything besides dominating those guys. I think I'll be in the same mindset regardless, but I think it'll be a little different based on what the series is at. When do you allow yourself to go there like visually? Like when you when you started like, you know, imagining, you know, the game or visually like start thinking, you know, <clears throat> start thinking through the game. You, are you there now or will you go a couple of days before? Uh, so I'll probably, I'll probably do it on Thursday. I probably won't do it today. I'll probably try and enjoy the game and, and kind of enjoy, enjoy just being in Yankee stadium, enjoy the fans, enjoy like the sights and sounds just because I'm, I feel kind of far removed from pitching, but I think yeah. watching Bieber pitch on, on Thursday and kind of just going out there and trying to almost analyze how he's going through the lineup and trying to pick up little things, still watching the game and staying lighthearted. <laughs> And then I think I'll, I'll truly get locked in that that night before. Usually I won't do anything like the day before, but that night before or sometimes even the day before, you'll see me. I'll be a little more reserved, a little more to myself, like not really talking to guys as much, like more just trying to get to that, that mind state. That's what like I would always tell myself, like like I would if I wasn't pitching tonight and I was sitting on the bench, I would I would be like visually like thinking through my game and I'll have to sit there and be like, bro, just enjoy this game. Like relax. <laughs> like that shit is like four days. Of, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, I, I can, it's so hard not to like already be there. You know what I'm saying? It's so hard. yeah. Enjoy tonight. Make sure you take that in and, and enjoy everything tonight. For sure. Well, Tristan, we appreciate the time. Uh, C has made me a, a fan of you, and, and you uh, have made me an even bigger fan now talking to you today. Good luck in game three. Good luck the rest of the way. Congrats on all the success. And we know uh, this is just the first outstanding season of what's going to be an incredible career. So thanks so much for hopping on R2C2, man. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, C. Appreciate you guys having me on. Yes, sir. You, you got it, man. Take care. See you guys.